Good afternoon. Mike's all right? Okay. I think we're taping all of this, so hence all the fuss <coughs> over the technology. Uh, I'm David Blight. I'm the director of the Gilda Lehrman Center, and I teach history here. Uh, welcome, a warm welcome to everybody to this panel on confronting coercion, building worker power in the 21st century. A uh, quick word here about what this is about and where it comes from. And uh, then I want to simply introduce the people who really put this panel together, and then I'm going to get out of the way. Uh, the Gilder Lehrman Center, about five, six years ago, began an initiative to study modern slavery, contemporary human trafficking, goes by many labels, labor trafficking, coerced labor. And uh, we did a conference in 2012. Uh, and a few people who are here now and will be here for our working group were part of that. It was a major conference that brought together uh, representatives or leaders of lots of NGOs who work on the problem of modern slavery and scholars, historians especially, but not exclusively. The effort then was in great part to mix scholars with NGO leaders, the, the activist world with the the world of scholarship. Um, it was an amazing event. It was an amazing collision of those two worlds. And uh, out of it came lots of connections, lots of ideas, and lots of uh, heat and controversy, uh, which this field has much of, as I've learned. Now, in the meantime, we've advanced that initiative, particularly with funds from the Rabina Foundation, which is one of the sponsors of this event. And one of the things that got a particular foundation interested in helping the Gilda Lehrman Center is this issue of modern slavery. So we now have two full year fellowships uh, for scholars working on some aspect of modern slavery. And I believe this is the fifth year we've done it. Uh, it uh, one of our first was Jessica Pliley, who's here somewhere, who wrote her book here. The book is out, um, uh, White Slavery and the FBI, um, among other things. And uh, uh, we're very proud of this initiative, very proud of this program. And now we have, in moving into its second year, a working group. Uh, we're simply calling it the Working Group on Modern Slavery. Um, and about 15 members uh, are, are, will either be here by tonight or tomorrow and Saturday for the second gathering of this working group. It's an international working group. Members from Australia, South Africa, the UK, uh, US, and probably leaving out a continent. Um, it's a remarkable group uh, of many different disciplines. And that group will be heading toward, in a year from now, we hope, a major new conference uh, on this problem of modern slavery, how to combat it, how to study it, uh, how to fund the studying of it, the controversies about the funding of this topic, and hopefully a major book that will come out of that conference, among other things. We're also doing a whole series of podcasts with the members of this working group. Three of those, I believe, were taped this morning. Uh, so, uh, there's a lot going on at Yale about modern slavery, and we're only one place that's doing it. Our co-sponsors for this event are not only the Robina Foundation, which helped fund this initiative, but the Center for the Study of Race, Indigeneity, and Transnational Migration, or known as RITM, uh, newly founded just a year, year and a half ago, uh, is co-sponsoring this, as is the Shell Center for Human Rights at the law school which has done a good deal of work on this issue as well. And I want to mention again our two translators, Alicia Schmidt Camacho, who's up here, and Luis Luna, who's back in the booth, out of sight. No, there he is, back in the corner, talking into his mic. Good. Um, OK, now, uh, I want to say a couple things about this topic, then introduce the leaders of it and get out of the way. Exploitation. Um, greed, uh, autocracy, tyranny, war, disruption, disaster, disposable people, all of these issues are, of course, very, very current, but also very, very old. Uh, the purpose of studying modern slavery, the purpose of this initiative at our center is to, in every way possible, 
mixed past with present. The present is always embedded in the past, and the past is always embedded in the present. 9-11 um, was not new. It happened in the Trojan War. Um, the slaughter and displacement in Syria today is not new. It's horrific, but it happened in the Hundred Years' War. Massive supply chains exploiting forced labor and poor people is not new. What may be new are the commodity and the scale of the problem today. Slavery is hardly new, as we all know. Its scale may be greater today uh, than ever. Uh, our colleague here at Yale, the great James Scott, the social scientist or whatever discipline he claims now, and he can claim any discipline he wants because he's written in all of them. Uh, Jim has a brand new book out about the origins of uh, the state and of civilization. He takes on these small subjects. Uh, and we hosted an event with him last spring about this new book. But in it, he says, and he's not claiming he's a historian, which is great. I mean, he can come anytime he wants. He says, history is that... History at its best, in my view, this is Jim Scott, is the most subversive discipline in as much as it can tell us how things that, are, that we are likely to take for granted came to be. The things we take for granted, how they came to be. It's a simple definition of why we do it, but it's beautiful. It works. All right, now... Uh, I'm going to introduce our, our two moderators. They will introduce the panelists, and then I will sit down and get out of the way. Our first moderator is Jennifer J. Rosenbaum, who goes by JJ. She's a member of our uh, GLC working group. Uh, she's many other things. She did her BA at the University of Tennessee, law degree at the Harvard Law School. She's now an independent scholar and consultant, especially about workers' rights and independent trade unions and labor migration strategies. And she has worked very closely with workers' groups, as you're just about to find out. She spent two years here, uh, 2015 to 17, at the Shell Center uh, for Human Rights at the Yale uh, Law School, where she was a Robina Foundation fellow. I should not ignore saying that. Um, she's taught in India at a law school in Delhi. She's taught at the Tulane Law School, and she has been deeply involved with uh, workers' organizations and indeed in defending workers in litigation uh, now for years. And uh, JJ has a great deal to do with inviting our guests today, and I'll let her tell you about that. Our other uh, co-moderator uh, is Gunter Peck. And Gunter is a historian. Uh, he is currently here at Yale as a full-year fellow. He's one of our full-year modern slavery fellows at the GLC. He's, uh, he holds a chair, a, a professorship at Duke University, where he's also uh, an affiliate or a member of the Terry Sanford Institute for Public Policy. Uh, he's the author of many, many, many articles about labor history and working class history. He's the author of the book entitled Reinventing Free Labor, Padrones and Immigrant Workers in the North American West, 1885 to 1930. He's here finishing one book, starting another. He's working on two books here this year, as I understand it. And Gunter, you can correct this if I don't have it right. One of them is called Race Traffic, Servants, Sailors, and Slaves in the Making of Whiteness over two centuries from 1660 to 1860. And the second one, um, and I think you're working on this order, but I'm not sure of that either. The second one is called The Shadow of White Slavery, Innocence, Rescue, and Empire in Contemporary Human Trafficking Campaign, which comes all the way to the present. So Gunter studies the world and this problem from 1660 to right now. Covers a lot of ground. Uh, Gunter and <coughs> JJ are going to moderate this panel, and I'm going to turn it over to my colleague. Thank you. And thank you all for coming. Well, I, uh, 
feel very lucky to introduce these panelists uh, who have uh, each of them over a decade of work organizing immigrant workers, building worker organizations and new forms designed to meet the challenges of our time and winning things that people thought were impossible, uh, both from the state and from major corporations like Walmart and McDonald's. And so at a time when on many different fronts, uh, many of us feel like we have impossible work to do and resistance, uh, I think it's very, I feel very appreciative of their time being here um, and laying out what they've learned uh, and, and what their vision is. Uh, so the topic is uh, confronting coercion, building immigrant worker power in the 21st century. Uh, and I'm gonna just go down the line and do introductions first. And then uh, Gunther and I have a set of, of questions to ask the panel and then we're gonna take questions from everyone in the audience. Uh, there'll also be a reception afterwards if you have questions you'd like to talk about one-on-one -on -one or you wanna talk about volunteering <coughs> with any of these organizations who all also are uh, emblematic for having worked with students and scholars and uh, faith leaders all are building really strong uh, and diverse tensions. Uh, so, so first of all, I want to start with introducing the Coalition of Amakali Workers, which is a worker-based human rights organization that built a model where accountability for workplace uh, conditions lies with the major corporations at the top of supply chains. Uh, and so they've brought corporations like McDonald's and Walmart, who had the leverage to change conditions in the fields, um, to the table to negotiate responsibility for raising wages and changing conditions. Um, and they've also built, uh, uh, helped build a, an independent fair foods program which enforces those standards uh, and has, as Gerardo will talk about, eliminated sexual harassment, modern day slavery, retaliation against workers from the tomato fields in Florida and uh, coming to an industry in a location near you, hopefully, so they're in a, an expansion mode. Um, Gerardo himself joined the coalition after hearing about it from roommates who were subjected to very extreme uh, slavery or workplace conditions and the coalition uh, worked with them, who got invited to a meeting, got involved, and is now sitting at the table running these negotiations with major corporations, uh, running investigations with the Department of Justice into egregious conditions, and also thinking thinking big about what's needed next. So we're really lucky to have her right up here. Um, Danielle Castellanos and Fausto Garcia are with the uh, National Guest Worker Alliance, which is a, a multi-sexual organization of originally guest temporary workers only and now expanding. That was originally founded after Hurricane Katrina in New Orleans and has gone national. <laughs> uh, Danielle himself also came as a guest worker um, and helped build, helped launch the first um, a major campaign with guest workers uh, around hotels um, and their treatment of workers after Hurricane Katrina. She was the first guest worker to testify before Congress on workplace conditions and enforcement measures needed um, at the federal level, um, and is now uh, leading a campaign both in uh, the New Orleans Gulf Coast and the uh, New Bedford, Massachusetts in the seafood processing industry that is again looking at the major brands that are purchasing seafood being processed in the United States and holding them to account for the conditions for workers. Uh, Fausto is uh, from Mexico. We're really lucky to have him here. He's both a binational worker and a binational organizer, which has helped build organizations of immigrant workers in Sinaloa, Mexico, where he's from, and uh, in the Gulf South. He has 17 years traveling uh, back and forth from Mexico to the U.S. as a worker um, and has experienced retaliation and abuse firsthand and also uh, of many different strategies for resisting that and for um, for making worker power move binationally, just like capital and products are moving, uh, despite the fact <coughs> that the laws are are inhibiting uh, that more. Uh, and then uh, finally, we have uh, Unidad Latina de Acción and Dan Perrigo, who is many of you may know from his work here in New Haven, also an organization of about. Up to snaps. Really appreciative that we have a local voice um, on these panels because it's really important that we not think that problems happen elsewhere <laughs> or not happen related to the institutions that we all are a part of. Uh, Ula works at the intersection of immigrants' rights and labor rights, um, has been involved in making New Haven uh, a one of the first 
city to have ID identifications cards for immigrant workers for starting down the road of keeping police out of immigration enforcement and in this current context for making sure that those uh, those protections are really meeting the current political context that we're in and like more sanctuary policies at the city level. We believe in some Columbia and was one of the founders of these So I know that was a lot, but also these are pretty amazing people. <laughs> uh, we were talking about how they are professors of life this morning. <laughs> and so I wanted you to just have a little bit of the texture of the work that they've been doing. And, and they're gonna, they won't be able to talk about everything that they're doing, but what we hope is that they can talk about the arc of, of 10 years of work and, and what they've learned. So I'm just going to set up first question and um, and also give a quick explanation of sort of how we why we're beginning where we are. Um, and essentially, we decided to flip the script. Uh, the script very often, in my experience of conversations about immigrant workers and the struggle that they are engaged with, is to present a long and important picture of the problem, of what uh, the good men and women who grow our food in this country are up against, for example. Um, what sometimes happens in that scenario is you get a picture that is so dire that it invites a kind of, uh, if not intentional, a kind of condescension or a sense of pathos that can be immobilizing. Um, I'll give you one quick anecdote to illustrate. Uh, as an educator in North Carolina, I have frequently taken my students to uh, meet immigrant workers to learn from their experiential knowledge and wisdom. And uh, we recent, a few years ago heard one story that was particularly uh, powerful and affecting uh, of an immigrant who had been brought here with the padron, who was exploited, held under gunpoint in a sharecropper shack where he was working for three fifteen a month. And uh, he quit when his padron paid him in crack cocaine. And he dug a hole under the floor and ran for 50 miles before he could find someone who would help him. It was a local flock organizer, farm labor organizing committee, and then he became one of the best organizers they had. Uh, my student who was listening asked the question, what's it like to be a slave? And uh, the organizer said, I'm not a slave. Um, uh, I'm an actor, and this is the greatest country on the planet. And it struck me as a kind of extraordinary paradox that uh, that the label of slavery will come to this itself was a problem. But it also made me think that what we need to do is to listen uh, before asking some leading questions. Having said that, I'm, the question we're going to ask is something of a leading question. But we want to turn it around and begin with, uh, in effect, to draw on, to invite the experiential wisdom, uh, the years of struggle and wisdom that is at this table. So our question um, is this, what does success look like at this point in your work as organizers? And what is your model and what has changed uh, for workers because of that success? And we'll just go down the, go down the road. Her, her Thank you very much. Um, I want to start by uh, just mentioning that we were just hit by a hurricane, Hurricane Irma. Uh, and I uh, wanted to show um, the name of a foundation that we know it's uh, uh, working on some efforts to be able to direct funds directly to the most affected um, agricultural communities, including Mokali. Lavelle and some other uh, in Southwest Florida. So if you are looking for a, a good place to support the people that uh, lost their jobs, lost their homes, um, they are trying to, to aim uh, on that direction. 
so one of the things is that um, the perfect program uh, was created by us as workers. Um, and it was after a big campaign that took place in the Mokali in the 90s uh, because of situations that uh, were happening always relating to violence in the field, uh, sexual harassment, discrimination, uh, stagnant wages, just to give you a sense, uh, a worker was receiving for 30 years since 1978 um, a wage that was uh, 40 to 45 cents for a utility pound bucket of tomatoes. That means more or less having to put two and a half pounds of tomatoes just to make the equivalent of the minimum wage. That's the reality that we uh, have to confront. And uh, in terms of uh, slavery, there were cases that have been prosecuted. Uh, there's a total of nine cases of slavery. Uh, 15 bosses have gone to jail for having people uh, in these conditions. And it's a modern day slavery where workers have been forced to work uh, at gunpoint in some cases and the threats of death uh, in every situation. And those threats um, are not just for the workers, sometimes they extend to the family in their home country. Uh, there's a death involved initially, uh, visas are taken away from people. And uh, contrary to what sometimes the perception might be, the slavery doesn't only happen to workers that are undocumented, because that's uh, sometimes an, an argument that comes to the table, like, Oh, so the, that happens because they are migrant workers. Of course, of course they are undocumented. Of course they are this because they don't speak English because of, they are vulnerable already. And um, the reality is that in all of the cases we have been uh, able to help uh, people escape directly from these conditions, working with the Department of Justice and the FBI, and um, workers were uh, workers that. Uh, had visas, for example, uh, workers that work here on their political asylum from uh, Guatemala, uh, or workers that came from Haiti, and uh, American citizens that were also uh, part of these, these uh, cases that were recruited in homeless shelters in big cities like uh, Miami, Tampa, and other uh, big cities in the country. So there's a total of uh, more than 1,200 workers that were uh, free from these conditions, 15 bosses that have gone to jail. And um, that's something that we are eliminating with uh, the perfect program by bringing the buyers to be part of the solution. And that happened because people around the country, consumers all over, uh, especially people from churches at the local and institutional level, but also students in uh, pretty much every major university in the country have stand with us to create a force that puts the, the market to do the right thing, to condition the purchasing of the tomatoes in the state of Florida and all over the East Coast now uh, to the application of the rights that are necessary for workers in the field. Um, well, I, I will recommend to you to, uh, to visit our website. Uh, if you can, it's uh, caw-online.org. And there you're gonna see uh, this uh, video uh, <coughs> made by CNN. It's uh, how America's ground steel for modern slavery was cleaned up by workers' group. And that's the story of Alejandrina um, Herrera. Uh, she was working in the field at the age of 14. Uh, she uh, suffered an attempted uh, rape by, by uh, her boss and uh, luckily she was able to escape because of the help of other worker that was fired um, for helping her. So what happened there was not uncommon for workers in general. And what we have seen is that with the implementation of uh, this program that was created by us as workers, um, we have been able to transform that reality um, there is a third party organization that was created with the purpose of overseeing the implementation of the rights that we created. And I'm just going to mention really quick a few of those rights that workers now have when they go to work um, in participating tomato uh, farms. 
Uh, some of the rights include uh, the payment of the penny per pound that now I think is close to $30 million that have been distributed. Um, that means uh, in a labor force of about 30,000 job spots that can be occupied in a year by two or three workers uh, each uh, because of the turnover in agriculture. Uh, it, an increase, a bonus of 30, 50, or 80 dollars. That depends on the amount of business interaction between uh, growers and one of the 14 corporations that have signed with us. So uh, that is an economic uh, change uh, for the workers. The, the bucket now is paid uh, in average 55 cents. Some companies pay uh, 60 cents. And uh, we eliminated the overfilling of the bucket, which means that workers don't have to put extra tomatoes on top. It's about 10% less tomatoes that when you pick them now, they will be translated in more uh, tomato buckets uh, that would actually be paid for the first time. Also, the right to complain without, uh, without uh, represalias. Uh, yeah, retaliation, I think. Uh, which gives workers the ability to complain uh, without having to ask themselves the question that was very common before. Uh, in lieu of situations of sexual harassment, discrimination, or, or every other abuse that has plagued our industry, uh, you as a worker would have to ask yourself, uh, especially women, do I try to defend myself and, and protect my dignity, knowing that the first response from the industry and this is before the program, uh, it's going to be fire me on the spot uh, if I'm lucky, or maybe I will be a victim of violence in the fields. Do I risk that? Uh, well, I know that I'm going to lose the ability to feed my kids. So if I ask you if that was a question that you had to consider before coming forward and bringing a complaint, what would you choose? Would you choose to feed your kids, or would you choose to protect your dignity? Thank you. Um, <clears throat> so I think I'm going to start answering this question with um, with a story. Um, so one of our friends, he he found a job in a restaurant that opened in New Haven like a few years ago. And he overheard um, a lawyer talking with the owner of the restaurant. And um, basically the question from the owner was, um, do you think it's okay to, for me to hire uh, illegal immigrants? And he said, yeah, sure. Uh, in the Haven, you don't have, you're not going to have any issues. Um, and then he said, but you have to be careful because there is an organization that if you don't pay the minimum wage, <laughs> they are going to come in after you. So um, so basically like, yeah, we have been in place uh, since 2002 in New Haven, and we start working um, for worker rights and the um, undocumented community because we work mostly with uh, just undocumented, undocumented people in New Haven by accident because I, we create a group um, just try to um, change the laws in Connecticut and back in 2002 uh, when the laws they became really hard in our community to have a driver license so before 2002 and I think after the incident in two, uh, and the September 11 changed everything uh, in the country mm -hmm. and in New Haven. It was easy before 2001 to get a, a driver license and then you know, after that, that, um, the, the incident of um, September 11, uh, the motor vehicles department changed everything and, and put all these regulations that you have to be came legal. You have to be legal in this country because if not, <clears throat> we don't want to provide driving licenses to future terrorists in this country. So um, then you know we got involved in that in that struggle and we we lost it. But during that time, you know, meeting like every week, you know, 
for a year to lobby the legislation in Connecticut. Then there was all the stories, you know, and I think every story every week is like people being, their wages being robbed and people being paid like a less than the minimum, minimum wage, not being paid over time. So that's how we start like uh, saying maybe we should keep the organization or keep this group and maybe start working for workers' rights and that's how we start Unida Latina in Acción. Um, so it has been a long struggle, but I think we have been successful in making sure that every business in New Haven, they know that they, they have to pay the minimum wage and I think usually they, they do it. Um, um, the other thing that we feel that is um, that has been a success is like um, that we have been able like to lobby the legisla the state legislation to increase the minimum salary, which is like um, another good thing for for the community. Um, empower the the workers. You know, I think one issue that we we face in the immigrant community and spe uh, especially in the undocumented community is like convincing people to speak up and say something, you know. But I think through all these struggles, um, people now feel more empowered you know, to speak up and say something and to sue their bosses, you know, if something is happening in their um, business, um, you know, in the workplace. Um, we have, um, we, you know, through a long conversations, you know, because like one thing that we <clears throat> we feel strongly is like waste theft is a crime. But when we go to the police department and I say, listen, um, the boss doesn't want to pay this guy. And they say, oh, that's a civil murder. You should go to the labor department. So we have, in, th in that case, we, you know, we thought that I think we we had to find a different road to like eventually uh, talk to the um, to the police department. So we went to the labor department and I say, listen, so is is um, waste theft a crime? And they say yes. And I say, can you come in and and have a, that conversation? Ah, <laughs> perdón, Luis. <laughs> so menos rápido. <laughs> So we have like, um, so we went to the labor department and I said, can you help us, you know, to have this conversation with, uh, with the police department in New Haven? And they say, yes, they came. And basically we create a partnership where right now the police department, they are willing to take these, um, these uh, accusations against bosses and then um, now they are more willing to come in with us and to put pressure on, on the bosses to like to pay the, the the workers, which I feel like we're the only place in Connecticut that that, that had that kind of partnership with uh, with them. Even though like we had all, all kinds of fights with them and, and other issues, so um, so the model that we have um, is not the model that is like a. It's not the U.S. model, you know. We feel like the U.S. model, you know, the union model, uh, I think is uh, doesn't really do that much for the workers, you know, and create like this very legalistic process. Um, we believe in our more indigenous model in Latin America, which is like direct action, so desmadre, porque, because I think that's the only way that really, like, if the law doesn't is not in our side and they accuse us to not have documents. I think they force us to really to be uh, to speak up. And so, even though like we use the legal part um, in every case that we take, we use the debt actions, and we use the debt actions because like that's the way to empower uh, empower the workers, but also to help us to create partnership with uh, other uh, communities and struggle. So. So everything I feel strongly in New Haven, a lot of things has been changed. Again, you know, like the bosses that are more aware of what's going on. Um, but um, yeah. <laughs> so yeah, so like, um, yeah, so the, um, they're more aware of what's going on and 
But the, I think the most important thing is like the, work, the workers at least in New Haven, uh, they are aware that there is an organization who are willing to work with them and to represent them. And that's why most of the cases that we're receiving right now in our, in our, in our organizations, they are from outside of New Haven. Thank you. Thank you, Javier. Thank you, Javier. You know, uh, as I represent me, you know, I'm from. I came from originally from Peru. Uh, I am, went to 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 New Orleans, Louisiana, as a guest worker. <coughs> I am a former guest worker. You know, and in the, in the National Guest Worker Alliance, born as a, the voice of the guest workers. You know, because you know they were discussing about the who. Are the, who are the people that are coming? Or they, they are. They have to come more people with visas because there is a lot of undocumented workers. <coughs> you know, we have to put people. You know, and we were not sitting in the table of discussion. And this is the, the way, why we are, we need to be on the on the table, no? To because they were talking about our our life, our faith, but nobody uh, talked with with us. Never. I was the first. You know, the guest worker that talked with with a senator or. A, Congressman in the United States, you know, face to face, they 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 rule our life, but they didn't know us, no. Uh, you know the NDA. For what is a success for the NDA? NDA, you know, uh, work with uh, uh, to create changes, uh, to create changes, create changes, new policies, you uh, to for the workers. You know, uh, for example, no, in the me for in order to come here to the United States. I had I had to pay five thousand dollars, even though I am I, I came with a guest worker visa. It's not free. You know, I had to put in my plunge my family in debt to 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 get here and, and, and buy a visa for ten months. Actually, it's, it's the same visa with a Coyote with Thai. No, actually, it, it's very very similar. That's, that's in, in the in there the conditions that guest workers are very bad. You know. Uh, uh, because you know you are tied to one employer. It's one of the things that we, we try to change. But we we fight a lot. We we I pay five thousand dollars, but you know, but the, we f start fighting on that because the debt was used by the employer as as a weapon against you. You know, you either when you start a job, you start from from you know five uh, uh, zero dollars. I I start minus five thousand dollars. That's a, a a big very big difference, no? Uh, you know, the, the, in, in we change, we got that. You know, we got to to do the DOL. You know, pu we push very hard with a lot of workers, guest workers, and we change that. Now the the, the employer has to pay all the expenses to come, to bring workers here. You know, and and the, and the law is more clear about that. Uh, you know, we, we create uh, workers power in, in the, the working places too. You know, the, we we have many cases. You know, we, one of, the, of these. Uh, in, in Brookbridge, Louisiana, we have a, 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 a seafood plant the name CJ's. You know that they they were working. They, they make the, the workers work for more than 16 hours a day. You know, living in very bad condition. Uh, every day, threat to beat them if they don't finish the the, the amount of of of, uh, of you know of, of product that they need to do. But and, and, and you know they do very fine of, uh, uh, encouraging. Fight with with, uh, with the, the work the employer, and they got, you know, they got the, the uh, changes for or not only or for the plants, you know, for all for all the plants around them, you know, in a domino effect, you know, that's that's very important, you know, the, 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 uh, and you know we are we are trying to make power to create power for workers. This is a part of the success. We we measure the success doing that. We went to rural places in Louisiana that you know is not the best place to organize. It's the deep south, you know. Many, many people don't like us because they, we are, you know, we speak Spanish and we are dark. You know, they, it's very, very difficult to be there in a more to organize there. No, and we will power with them creating committees. You know, we're now right now we are working in, in Henderson, Louisiana, trying to get. Uh, a, a, we got a committee of seafood workers. You know, the, the people that works in a seafood plant, in a fish plant, there. And, and we are trying to, to you know, to make them like a, getting their, their, you know, strength in very, very horrible place, no? And the, the other thing is, we, we are to win that. We we create new, uh, you know, uh, invented new regulations, invented new things, new, new ways to get that, 
we we create this the the, the we call the fourth labor prevention accord. We, it, it's a it's a new thing that we are gonna try in in a, in a few months, and, and we hope that you you could help on us on that because we are trying to these these people with the power of the, of the court, the court gonna gonna do that the uh, the workers uh, go to the to the, to, to, the, to the supply chain, no, no go to only to the, because the, the actually sometimes the, the employer is not uh, the best place to, to you know, to, to get the, the as, uh, to get something for the workers, as the, the, the immokalee workers, you know, show us, you know, we have to make responsibility on another person. In the case of CA, for example, 90% of the, of the product was, was sell to Walmart. You know, and, and who is the, the real boss of this, this, these workers? The, the CAs or the, the uh, Walmart? Because Walmart push them to work more, to, 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 to accomplish the, the amount of, 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 of seafood that they, they needed. No? And that uh, is another thing, you know, to, to try to, uh, get, you know, try to, to do this and force the, 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 the employers to, and, and the, the customers. In the, in, the, in the enterprises like Costco, Whole Foods, to sign the, this accord, gonna provoke that the, um, the, the you know the respect of workers from, from the employer because if they they sign, for example, the Costco sign the agreement, the accord, you know we you know because they sell the, this this little company sell to Costco, they gonna force them to to pay better or, or have better rights to, to them. You know this is the the, the, the thing that we are thinking. Uh, you know, it's, it's very important to, you know, we want to develop a little bit more in the, in, in the next question, uh, but uh, uh, NDA, uh, you know, is working with now in, in not only with the guest workers, we are working with, with only all the sector, because we saw that the only organizing guest workers, we win, we win a lot of things for guest workers, but you know, there is a part of the plan. When you see a working place, a working site, you see that there are uh, guest workers, Local workers, people that were working for a long time there, or, and they are uh, undocumented workers. If you fix only the problem for one of, of these, these groups, you will fix the problem for all the sectors. And, and now we decide to change, and we are, try, we are, we are starting to organize all the sectors. We, we choose the, the, the seafood industry because in Louisiana is a big industry. And, 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 and we are developing new ideas, and, and we, are, we are trying to, to, to get the success that we want. Muy buenas tardes a todos y pues ya estoy escuchando a mis compañeros y realmente eh, todo lo que ellos han dicho pues yo lo he vivido, yo apenas tengo el mes de mayo que yo salí de la planta de trabajar, mi uña se me perdió y apenas está creciendo de nuevo, ¿por qué? porque es un trabajo mmm, desafortunadamente muy duro, ya lo han dicho ellos, jornadas, perdón, perdón, So I also have to contain myself as a translator because I'm much more excited listening um, than sharing. But um, good afternoon. Um, I am also listening with you to the work of my companions, the words of my companions, and I um, share that reality, and it's, um, it's something that I have lived only um, just last May, I left um, the factory where I was working um, with um, an injury to my hand. I lost my nail because um, truly the work there is um, very difficult and um, there's very few protections for us. Y hago esta mención porque para mí, por parte de la Alianza de Trabajadores Huéspedes, ganamos mucho. ¿Por qué? Porque rompí una barrera que está totalmente todavía fuerte, lo que es la lista negra que llamamos o lista blanca, como le quieran llamar. Y es cuando ya un empleador eh, usa la frontera, te, bota, te vas a México a esperar una visa, ya no puedes regresar y la frontera está de por medio. <coughs> So um, I mentioned this story because through the National 
Guest Worker Alliance, we have accomplished a great deal. We've been able to break a major barrier, which is the black list um, that employers keep of workers who they um, who are organizing or they find threatening. Um, and employers have been using the border to expel workers um, that they no longer wanted to keep. And so workers would be sent back uh, across the border and find that they were unable to obtain a visa to return. Y ese problema actualmente lo tenemos con muchos compañeros en México que han levantado su voz, que se han manifestado en contra de los reclutadores que cobran grandes cantidades, como lo dijo mi compañero. This is an important problem in Mexico. Many, many workers who were active in defending their own rights, who spoke up against abuses and who spoke up about the price that they were paying to obtain the visas, Um, have been barred from returning. Y no nada más eh, dinero. A las mujeres prácticamente todo el tiempo son acosadas sexualmente y coaccionadas al miedo porque no pueden hablar. ¿Por qué? Porque ellas casi la mayor parte que trabaja en el sector de la industria del marisco. Okay. So not only these workers, but women have experienced um, grave problems um, and have been afraid to speak out. They experience almost every day forms of sexual harassment and coercion. And under this coercion, they um, have a very difficult time fighting back. Y esto es un motivo fuerte de ellas que no hablan porque tienen otro motivo más fuerte. Tienen hijos que mantener y casi la mayor parte son madres solteras y son vulnerables cuando llegan a este país que no hay todavía y no hemos podido lograr que las leyes fijen algo al respecto. So these are um, particularly vulnerable members of this workforce as women, many of them are single parents um, and as such they are unwilling sometimes to sp or unable to speak out for themselves because they have an even greater uh, commitment to feeding their children and this is widespread problem in the seafood industry where i work um, um, and this exists because in this country there are as yet no laws which cover this vulnerable population eh, ahorita nosotros formamos parte de o organizamos una coalición en méxico precisamente para ayudarles a ellos. We have now organized the coalition in Mexico to assist these workers in Mexico. Eh, con la, diciéndoles y eh, buscando la manera de cómo poder ellas y todos y que conozcan realmente los derechos que tenemos y cómo enfrentar esto porque ese es el problema, desconocimiento de los derechos. And our goal here is to create uh, an organization there where people will learn their rights, be able to defend their rights, because um, not just women, but all workers are made vulnerable because they don't know what their rights are. Bueno, este es un tema muy fuerte. Yo... Eh, me voy a salir un poquito, pero digo, voy a centrarme a lo otro que ahorita la Alianza de Trabajadores del Marisco y Pescado ha logrado. That is a very important and heavy topic. I'm going to turn now to some of the things that um, the workers in the seafood industry and the National Guest Worker Alliance have achieved. Y ha logrado, logró romper una situación de fuerte discriminación en cuanto al derecho de organizarse. First, we have managed to break a barrier on organizing, which was a primary form of discrimination we experienced as workers. Esto lo digo por experiencia propia. Si yo lo logré, ellos se reflejan en lo que yo logré. And this is my own personal experience. If I can come to a place where I can defend my rights, and achieve um, um, that, then they, these other workers working with me, can also achieve it. Porque ellos ya lo entienden y lo van entendiendo. Organizados es la única forma como podemos 
sacar adelante y obtener todo lo que nosotros queramos, pero necesitamos unidad. And it's only by becoming a unified, organized group that we can have power to defend our rights. Y, y estamos llevando a, hacia el campo y hacia esas partes lejanas del estado de Luciana, que es un, la parte de, más fuerte y dura del racismo, porque de repente te encuentras esas banderas confederadas, da miedo en esos campos. Y la mayor parte de las industrias del marisco están totalmente aisladas. So it is a very difficult climate in which to organize in Louisiana because um, it is a, is a state that um, uh, is a climate of great racism and discrimination against us that um, makes us fearful when we're organizing um, because you see Confederate flags and that reminds you of your vulnerability. Um, and um, it is uh, the hardest industry is in the um, seafood industry because you're very isolated. Eh, le digo esto porque los compañeros que quedaron en la mesa directiva, o sea, las cabezas, fueron llamados por el patrón y les dijeron, no queremos más que sigan organizándose en las trailas mías, que son del patrón. No queremos más organizaciones ni queremos que se junten en las trailas de las personas que trabajan en, en industria por favor les dijo pero es una coacción yes so um, the organizers who formed the steering committee of um, our organization were called in by the boss who said I don't want you organizing in the trailers that I own here We don't want to see you creating this association and you may not be using our, or, um, our my trailers. And um, this is a form of coercion. Bueno, eh, esto nos da más motivación a nosotros porque ellos se resistieron y están ahora más fuertes. Siguen adelante y van a continuar. This only gave no, us Dios. greater motivation to fight back. We didn't give in to our fear and um, we have been able to move forward in our organizing. Bueno, muchas gracias. So we wanted to shift to hear more from you on the inspirations for the work, the movements that you call on and think, think about for strategy when you're in these very <coughs> difficult situations uh, and I think one thing that's come clear across the presentations is that the work is very intersectional. There's immigrants rights work, there's work in relation to the women's movement, there's work in relation to the, women, the labor movement. Um, we're curious about how the modern day slavery movement has or has not connected uh, with the work that you've done. So we'd just like to hear a little bit more about it and it can be um, you personally as an organizer as well as the, um, the movements that your members are bringing and they're calling on from their home countries as well. So maybe we'll uh, go in reverse order this time to mix it up a little bit. Disculpen, estaba en otro. ¿Cuál fue la pregunta, perdón? Uh, bueno, a mí, desde que empecé como organizador, porque ahora estoy de organizador, aunque ustedes no lo crean, <ríe> eh, el movimiento que a mí me ha, me ha llamado mucho la atención eh, es el movimiento en la Alianza de Trabajadores Huéspedes, cuando ellos eh, iniciaron esta organización, porque no nada más somos NGA, están los de TAN, que son afroamericanos, estamos unidos, y están los de Congreso, que es otra de puros eh, compañeros que son este, trabajadores Oh, perdón. No, no, sí, no, sí. Ah, son trabajadores eh, 
de, le llaman jornale, este, congreso jornaleros, son trabajadores de las esquinas. Y me ha tocado incluso participar en movimientos fuertes, en campañas, incluso la semana, hace dos semanas, estábamos en una campaña de la lucha por los 15, y ahí andaba yo, y eso me emociona. So, um, the organization that has excited me the most is um, the Alliance of um, Guest Workers. Um, but not only them, but their capacity to work alongside um, organizations that represent black workers, um, and the Congreso, which is an organization that uh, organizes day laborers together. Even though you don't believe might not believe it, I am an organizer, and um, I en enjoy uh, this work. Eh, aparte de todo esto, mm, desde mi pueblo natal, en Sinaloa, y en, anduve en campañas fuertes, me acordé del tomate, y me da a mí eh, una esperanza, de cambio. Creo que podemos hacerlo si queremos. Yo en la mañana les dije a los compañeros que eso es de conciencia y de corazón. No hay más. No vaya oh. a hacerme llorar mientras. ¿eh? <laughs> um, so I forgot to mention that he had participated in a campaign um, for um, raising the wage, the minimum wage to $15 an hour, but um, he's also inspired by um, the experience of campaign for labor rights in Sinaloa, his home state, um, where they worked on campaigns around um, tomato production. And he says, these experiences give me great hope for change. I believe that we can make change happen if we want that change. Um, and as I told, Um, the compañeros here earlier this morning, it's a matter of conscience and a matter of heart. Y en cierta forma, las motivaciones, pues más que otra cosa, mm -hmm. es mm, mi familia, los que vienen atrás. Yo, gracias que llegué a los 61, voy a llegar. Eh, y ellos vienen todavía, esas gentes que todavía no saben, no conocen, pues ir enseñando un camino mejor. Y creemos que podemos tener un futuro mejor si todos queremos mejorar y le ponemos ganas a eso. So I'm not only inspired by that, but especially by my own family and for those who come after me, um, who don't yet know this struggle. Um, and in, it is in my struggle that we can work together to make a better future for all of us. <laughs> okay, thank you, Fausto. You know, the, the, this question is, a, is a very tricky, you know, because the, you know, the, the slave, anti-slavery thing, you know, the, but you know, Actually, you know, we, in the NGA, the National Guest Worker Alliance, we consider that the guest worker program is a, is a form of trafficking or, or new, like uh, forced labor or new modern slavery. Uh, you know, we, because I'm gonna, I'm gonna describe a little bit the, the visa, you are tied to one employer. You live in, in, in the property of the, of the employer, control, totally control. You know, the, uh, you know, you have to pay the, for, for that, or you know, at least half a debt in your country. And, and you know, and, and that's uh, many people, you know, we, we talk with uh, a lot of survivors of, of, of after Katrina, of survivors of Katrina, African American people there, and we talk about our stories there, and they say, oh, that sounds very similar to happen to my, my, my people. Uh, so, very, very close to, to slavery, you know. And that's, uh, you know, and for example, you know, the many of, of the employers, when, when we start doing this, confiscate the, the, the passport with the visa to the, to the employer, to the employees. You know? 
you know, they got the, the, this and they hold the, this passport because they, they were bad treated and they, they send them, you know, uh, they, they can't escape, you know, they, they, are, they, have to, they were forced to, to work with them. That's a, a, a big problem, you know. Blacklisting that, you know, the, the Mr. Fausto talked about that. It's, it's a very, you know, form to, to, to make you, maintain you silent. Don't say anything about that. Don't say anything about the, the situation that you are, you are living. No matter you are, you know, harassed uh, sexually, because there are a lot of the women that we are organizing now are, are Mexican women so that they brought with visas, and they don't, they don't want to say anything because they are afraid, you know? And, and, uh, and we, we think that, you know, very deep that the oppressed workers and communities have to work together, we have to unite, you know? In, in Ola, in Ola, we, we work together, you know, we heard the, from, with Stan, with Dignity, that is a, a local community organization of African-American people. Mostly of them, they, they, you know, the system makes us to fight each other, you know, to fight, you know, divide and conquer, you know? They say, oh, these Latinos came and steal your job. Or these are uh, black people are lazy, and then you don't, you don't have to care about them. You know, we have these, the, the, uh, you know, the dynamics there too. You know, and we, we fight. You know, and what is the way, way, way to fight? We put uh, all the, these two communities in one organization together. You know, we have the, an umbre under the umbrella of the New Orleans Workers Center for Racial Justice. We work uh, NGA. We work uh, Congreso de Jornaleros that uh, you know work with uh, undocumented workers and. The, uh, stand with dignity, local African American workers, mostly unemployment, and uh, employers, and, and that you know create a very very uh, you know mixed, you know, uh, it's a, in, in many people came to New Orleans to know about this because in many places you know the uh, workers fight each other, you know they said no oh, it's your fault your fault, but now here we we work together for ten years, and, and we are working very well, you know actually we got a community that we never got before. You know, and, and we, we are, you know, do, doing work together. That's very important. Uh, <clears throat> organizing in the South is super difficult. You know, the, the, the Mr. Fausto said about the Confederate flags, you know, uh, about, you know, the people that see you because you speak Spanish or you speak a, a different, or they saw you different color, they split you very close to provoke you. And that's that's thing that we live to. I was threatened with a shotgun twice in, in, in this, in 10 years organizing in, in the South. They said you have to go out, do a trespassing, you go out uh, of, my, of my property with a gun, in, in, in with a shotgun in hand, you know, me and my, and my co-workers, unfortunately. Uh, and, and you know, we work around the civil rights movement and the th 13th Amendment. You know, it's very important to, 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 you know, because the people forget, you know, and, and we have very good tools, but the people, we have to, in good tools that we could use together here to, to, to do better, you know. And, and the, the last thing I want to say, because JJ uh, look at me very. <laughs> 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 that, 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 you know that the immigrant movement now is called the new civil rights movement, you know, because you know we are suffering may, may, maybe the, not the same, but you know similarly to our, to our brothers, uh, African Americans, and that's uh, uh, and that's we have to recognize that to to move to push and move together that this this issue. Thank you. Um, so there is a lot of movements that inspire many of us, and not necessarily they are in the United States. Even though, like we have been working with the with the immigrant movement and the anti-police brutality movement that has been like uh, in our hearts, you know, in, in my organization and with me. But I think you know when we start working with Unidad Latina, we feel like. We had like enough experiences and being part of enough movements in Latin America. That's why we create the model that we we're working with in in our group. And you know, like in my in my, in my case, is like uh, I'm from Colombia and I was part of the student movement and the union movement in Colombia. And there, um, you risk your life. You know, when you get involved in this kind of things. You know, like. Uh, in my case, I, I was in jail and I, I was tortured because my activities with the teachers union there. So when I came to this country, I, you know, like with all the legalities and the human rights respects according to this country. So 
<laughs> there is not like a, a, a lot of risk that they they kill you. They 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 punish you in another way. So that's why we see we saw a lot of opportunities to you know to implement that model here. You know, and when we talk with uh, members of my organization, a lot of people they are indigenous people fighting against mining companies and you know being mobilizing and being detained and being mem their members or their family members being killed. So I think that's that's an inspiration that we we, we use all the time. And so back in 2004, we start like a conversations with the with the city of New Haven uh, to create like an ID for the for our community. And I remember like that that just idea and just because the mayor say oh that's very interesting let me let me think about it and the year law school got involved and they saw the possibility to create that document just that idea they mobilized a, a, a very anti-immigrant movement in new haven uh, the white supremacy groups they start coming to new haven and they were not able to really like um, change our minds and, and change the mind of the mayor in that time and not keep exploring the idea. So they start going to after like the, the Afro-American community and going to those churches and passing information saying, hey, you know like you're poor and you don't have opportunities because all these people they are stealing your jobs and these people they are like taking your resources and they are like, uh, they are they are they are illegals and they don't belong in this country. Um, actually, that that really create a, a lot of animosity among the the two communities, you know, like the immigrant and and the Afro American community. Um, so we decided to create like a, some kind of a, a dialogue, and we call it Blue Blacks and Latinos United. And that was just a dialogue, you know, just talking about both experiences, you know. And you know, Africans, uh, Afro Americans, talking about about their experience of being, you know, like their ancestors being slaves, and us talking, yeah, but we're the new slaves in this society. And and when somebody work in a farm, you know, milking cows for like two dollars an hour, or like somebody even in the middle of Yale University making like four or five dollars an hour. I think that's modern slavery. And from that time, we figured out like that was the kind of language that we're going to be using to adv keep advancing our uh, campaigns, you know, uh, for against wage theft. And, and from that time, we figured out like we need to keep working with all these other communities who have been like suffering in this country. Um, so, Basically, that's how um, we saw the opportunity, and and that's how we like uh, we we feel strongly right now that we had a close tr connection with uh, these communities and the struggle because at the same time we shared the you know like the same struggles like our police brutality. You know, when I mentioned it, that in some ways we work with the police department against waste, but at the same time, you know, this the same police officer is like beating us on the streets. Uh, so now we have like this intersectional like struggle there that, you know, is making our movement stronger. So what inspired us? Um, that's, a, that's a very big question, I think. Um, in our case, as a community, uh, the movement that started in Imokali, focusing on the growers and how to transform that entire industry, not, not just going one case after another of abuse, one case after another of slavery, sexual harassment, and all of those uh, situations. Uh, the organization was uh, aiming to change um, in a systemic way the entire industry. And that was the, the beginning of, of the struggle. The way in which that was uh, started was with the popular education methods that uh, people brought from their own 
uh, home countries. Uh, there's uh, our community is uh, mainly formed by workers from uh, Mexico, uh, mainly southern Mexico at the beginning of that coalition, uh, Guatemala and Haiti. And uh, many of those workers were part of different movements. Uh, many of those workers were actually tortured, trying to escape from the, the situation uh, uh, happening in Guatemala uh, with the guerrillas and the government uh, punishing peasants that were trying to just live a life uh, where they were not hungry, you know? Uh, or the situation in Haiti. Um, same thing, people were trying to escape poverty and, and repression from their governments. Um, Southern Mexico has not been a stranger to that. Um, and in, in reality, Mexico today is it's, uh, in a really sad place when it comes to human rights. So our inspiration comes from those struggles, from the fact that it doesn't matter how hard uh, systems in place, political, economical, or otherwise, uh, pushes down, try to uh, make us invisible to the rest of the world, our resilience um, pushes through to stand up again and again and again. Uh, and we won't give up. We cannot give up um, because uh, the future of our families, um, it's, it's on the line. So in the process of organizing, you know, we have been um, looking at and been inspired also by the civil rights movement, for example. Uh, in a transition between our struggle, uh, focusing on the growers, uh, where we did a hunger strike of 30 days, there was a march against violence after a worker was uh, uh, brutally beaten, uh, covered in blood. Uh, he was left uh, on, the, on the ground um, and he was victim of violence for stopping to drink water. Uh, he was denied permission by the crew leader. And there was a march uh, to the crew leader's house with 500 workers uh, declaring that um, beating one of us is beating us all. And we're not gonna tolerate this anymore. Uh, there was um, a march of 234 miles. And um, during those days, during those actions, um, after the hunger strike, one grower was asked by another one, a um, little bit smaller, why is it so hard for you to sit at the table with these uh, workers? Some of them have gone to the hospital. Um, you don't have to agree with them, but at least give them a moment to, to speak, you know, uh, hear them out. The response of that grower at that time was, I'm gonna put it to you this way, a tractor doesn't tell a farmer how to run his farm. So the last action that we did was aiming to, for, for one last time, appealing to the humanity of the industry that at the same time was denying us our own humanity. Uh, they saw us as tractors. So we went with this uh, Statue of Liberty we made it uh, of uh, chicken wire, I think it's called, um, and uh, you know construction materials. And uh, this uh, Statue of Liberty was brown, just like us. Um, it was uh, she was holding a tomato bucket instead of a book of mm -hmm. uh, welcoming the immigrants, you know. And uh, it had a tomato on her hand. Uh, this statue became part of the history of the coalition and is now sitting on the Smithsonian, in case any of you are in DC. Uh, it's part of a permanent exhibit uh, called The Nation We Build Together. Yeah. Now, I'm mentioning this um, because, um, you know, many times we think that when we hear the, the stories going on of abuse, uh, it's very common to, to focus on that and it's very common to lose hope. But we forget that we are bringing a light into the darkness of the moments in which we live. And we need to keep that light going. And the only way to do that is by working together and supporting the things that are actually changing the realities. And one of the things, or where I think this could begin, is by recognizing the humanity of the workers um, when I think about how people try to put us in a little box, uh, that's the thing that I hate the most. Um, I hear analysts, I hear professors, TV anchors, politicians use us you know, to justify the creation of new laws, the creation of walls. Um, 
and to blame us for everything that's, uh, that's wrong with society. Uh, we are referred to very often as uh, unskilled labor, in the case of farm workers. People forget that we do these jobs since we were kids. Many of us didn't went to school, not because we didn't want it to, but because there was no chance for us. We needed to survive. But that doesn't eliminate our ability to be intelligent people. Many people think of us as voiceless, as powerless, dependent, ignorant, unable to come up with the right strategies to change our realities, uh, needing saviors. And I'm, I just want to say that we're tired. I'm tired of hearing that because that is not the reality for us. We're not looking for anybody to save us, to stand for us, and give us uh, a strength to be able to defend ourselves. We know the strategy. In our case, we have bring down 14 corporations to agree with us. And that was not because corporations wanted to do it. It was because we took the streets and because we were not alone, because we asked people and people here what we had to say, and people started to recognize our humanity. We're not looking for anybody to come to save us, to give us the right strategy. We're asking people to stand with us under the recognition of that humanity. We feed the nation, and I deeply feel that this nation is in a very big debt uh, to the workers in the fields and workers in other industries. And that debt can only be paid in solidarity, standing with us to change our realities and uh, arrive to a place in which we don't have to be so vulnerable that when a hurricane hits us in Louisiana or Florida, or a freeze that leave people without a job, leave us basically homeless while we're working 10, 14 hours a day. It is time to stop that madness, and we need to work together. So, thanks. So we're gonna do a lightning round now. We're just gonna do one minute teasers on the future. Like where are you going based on like everything you've told us so far? Uh, and then we're going to open it up for some broader questions and discussions from, from folks who are here. Uh, so, Danielle, do you want to start? Okay. You know, the, the where, where, where are we going? After this, or uh, <laughs> our organization? No, we, we no, we think very deeply. You know, we think very deeply that you know the only way to grow is to you know, have uh, you know uh, direct actions like the, our you know this table said, you know, and you know to organize. The only way is to organize, 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 organize. It's very important to 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 have this in your head because. Uh, we 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 organize because we are the, the, the part that they are suffering, but uh, you have to know why and uh, how you know? how you you could help us, how you support us, how you you see us as a human human being, and that's uh, uh, very important to to know. We are, we, are, we are our growth is going to the supply chain because it's a challenge for us. Now we are uh, uh, maybe you don't know it, you don't realize this, but you are part of the supply chain too. You know, you are a customer. You know, you are, we are part of that, and we are trying to teach that to uh, to our members. You know, that, that's very important. You know, because they they know where they are, they know who is responsible for them. Now, you know, you 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 don't know. It's, it's you are in, in the in the limbo. And working with we in us, we are working because you know you, there are many people that are coming from different countries to work in the U.S. We are uh, working with the center countries. Uh, in the immigration corridor that we, we, we call, there are many countries that send people from Central America, from North America, from Mexico. You know, in, in Mexico, here we are working with a coalition in, uh, of, of, of workers in, in Sinaloa, and we are create, can, creating campaigns to, campaigns to expose employers to create the power of the seafood, seafood, seafood workers. And, and you can help on that, on that, you know, you can help on that. You can support as, as the same that you support the, the you know the coalition of democratic workers. We, we we are creating this opportunity for all of you, you know, to, to be part of it. 
Don't, don't be, you know, passive. Mm -hmm. Be active. You know, do something. You, we, not only we don't depend on a, a student, we have to depend on all of you. No matter, I, I'm not a very young guy, but you, I try to, to move <laughs> this because it's very important. No, not for me, it's for many people that are behind me. And, and you could help that. We, we have the opportunity to share information then, later, to waste what and how you could help us. Thank you. Bueno. Pues yo nada más les quiero decir que no tengo fuerzas para cansarme. Tengo que seguir adelante. Ya lo dijo el compañero ahorita. Y yo les digo, y en la mañana lo dije también, el peor de nuestro enemigo, el peor, el peor, es el miedo. Es una de las cosas que ahí está. Y también les digo, tenemos una arma muy poderosa, pero no la utilizamos a veces. ¿Y cuál es esa? Yo no necesito más que una hoja y un lápiz en mi mano. ¿Por qué digo esto? Porque dijo un compañero, el presidente de la Alianza Trabajadores del Marisco y Pescado en Henderson, él me lo dijo, vale más una pálida tinta que una mente brillante. Y eso es muy cierto. Yo hablo esto porque... Ah, perdón. I know, I'm breaking your flow. <coughs> well, I don't have the strength to get tired. I have to move forward. The worst enemy we have is fear. It's one of those things that's always there. But we have a great weapon, even though we don't always use it. And I was saying this morning, and I'll say it again, I only need a pen and a paper in my hand. Why do I say this? Well, as one of the organizers said, a, the palest ink is more valuable than a brilliant mind. <coughs> bueno, esto que hablé es por la siguiente razón. Mm. Yo no soy una persona que, pues, mmm, nací ahorita, ya tengo mis abriles, y, y he trabajado en el campo, acarreando tomate, sacando algodón cuando estaba chico, ordeñando vacas en el pescado. Soy de un puerto, fui pescador, soy pescador. He trabajado aquí fileteando pescado. He trabajado en el oil spill. He tenido muchas facetas. Y he tenido muchos problemas por mi forma y mi carácter de ser. Well, let me tell you. I'm not exactly a young person. But I have many Aprils behind me. And I've worked uh, in tomato. I've worked in cotton. I've worked... Um, with cattle and I'm from a port city so I've worked as a fisherman and I've also been working in the industry seafood industry filleting fish but I've always had problems because of my way my personality and my way of acting quizás me salga un poco de la pregunta pero a veces son cosas importantes que hay que mencionar y yo soy una de las personas que siempre he tenido miedo a cámaras, he tenido miedo a muchas cosas, porque yo fui parte de un movimiento en México muy fuerte y grave. El gobierno de México a mí prácticamente me anduvieron buscando para matarme. 1975-76, por un gobierno que era Luis Echevarría Álvarez, no me quería. And I'm a, maybe taking, getting a little bit away from the question, but I um, think it's important to share this with you. I've always been afraid of cameras, of publicity, of many things, because I was part of a big movement in Mexico, and um, it led to my persecution by the Mexican government that was looking for me, um, in particular in 1975 and 1976, when the president 
uh, Echeverría. Well, he didn't like me. Y lo que quiero llegar es a este punto. Ahorita estamos eh, aquí. Los veo a todos, a cada uno. Quisiera yo, como dijo el compañero, ese apoyo, esa fortaleza, sentirme yo que voy a salir, pero que de lo que yo hable, que no nada más sirva ahí para, para que pase por uno y no salga por el otro. Que algo quede y apoyo, que es lo que más ocupamos, pero unidos, porque solo nosotros no vamos a poder lograr lo que queremos. So I'm looking at all of you and I see each one of you. And I'm thinking that what I need to do to get out of this room, I want to come away from this room with something concrete with the support from all of you. Um, so I'm hoping that our words don't go just the way words do in one ear and out the other, but that you will join with us and that you will offer us your strength and be the strength behind us that we need. Y pues, um, como les digo, yo puedo permanecer aquí 24 horas hablando y diciendo cosas. Afortunadamente, tenemos tiempos. <laughs> so I could stay here 24 hours and keep talking to you, but unfortunately, we don't have that kind of time. Yes. Muy bien. Um, so, ¿cómo se ve el futuro? Um, one of the things that, that um, I would encourage you is to support um, the efforts in expanding the gains that we have achieved. Um, since 2011, we started implementing all the list of rights that are contained in this booklet. Um, the right to work free of sexual harassment, free of violence, uh, the right to also uh, be entitled to um, have the ability to form a committee on health and safety, uh, which is really important. And um, all of this was implemented in Florida, in 90% of the industry represented by the Florida Tomato Growers Exchange. Um, a few years after, and because of the agreement with Walmart, we were able to expand these same protections to uh, six other states. Uh, among them is Georgia, uh, South and North Carolina, Virginia, Maryland, and New Jersey, and I think that those are, are all the six states. Um, so this is something that is not just in tomatoes now, because uh, a couple of years ago, these same protections expanded to uh, strawberries, and uh, peppers. And we are working with uh, Migrant Justice in Vermont uh, to implement something that we call, um, in collaboration with them, in collaboration with uh, the Workers' Rights Consortium working in Bangladesh, uh, the Bangladesh Fire Accord. We have been um, working on basically extracting the uh, DNA of the Fair Food Program to implement something that works on their realities. Uh, migrant justice call it uh, milk with dignity. They are pushing uh, Ben and Jerry's, and uh, I encourage you to uh, follow their struggle and support it if you can from here. Um, the Workers' Rights Consortium just recently uh, was able to include um, from the provisions that we created for workers in the fields to have the right to form these committees on health and safety Uh, they extracted uh, what works in our reality to implement it and expand it for three more years in uh, Bangladesh. And if I'm not mistaken, I think it is something that impacts millions and millions of workers um, over there. We're also exploring the collaboration with workers in other countries like Morocco. Um, the Chilean government is also interested in trying to see uh, if, if uh, something like this could work in the reality of uh, farming over there. Uh, people from uh, southern Mexico has uh, been in touch with us, people from Texas. So all of this is to say that this is, no, this is not a, a campaign, even though I am campaigning right now. And I <laughs> encourage you to boycott Wendy's, because uh, they are next on the list. Uh, 
Kroger hasn't signed. It's a supermarket. Uh, Publix uh, have, have not signed onto the Fair Food Program. But, but I want to say this. It is not about a specific campaign. Uh, we need to campaign against these corporations to bring them on board. But it's, it's way beyond that. It is not a campaign against any particular brand. It is a campaign in which we're trying to bring those who make, uh, who matter the most in the big scheme of things, to be able to shake the foundation of the entire food industry in this nation mm -hmm. and be able to connect human rights with um, business, connect both together uh, so that the market cannot exist without respecting and ensuring that human rights in their supply chain are a reality. And that's something that we can only achieve by working together. So I encourage you to support these efforts. We call these the worker-driven social responsibility uh, model. And it's a model that can be exported, can be replicated in other realities under the right conditions. And it doesn't have to be exactly as it is um, in the fields of Florida. It can take different dimensions. But one thing is central. It needs to be created, directed, overseen by those who are uh, suffering the conditions that, that they are trying to change in their own communities. So that's, that's the future, I think. I feel that we are uh, closer to the dream that we once have, um, the dream that one day we will be treated with the respect that we deserve. But we still need to push um, a lot of corporations to understand that even though we are farm workers um, in a small town uh, in a corner of Florida, that we're not alone. So. So <clears throat> the future is something that worried uh, our members. And mm -hmm. People keep asking and coming to our meetings. And, and I say, well, I guess the only thing we need to do is like keep resisting, you know. And, and you know, we had like a lot of experiences of being in, in the struggle. So I don't think that is that different than what we have been seeing in our countries, which is in sometimes is much worse. So resisting and organizing, I think that's 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 the how we see the future, you know, especially with this new administration where it's creating all these new policies where like um even though like they're not implemented, but we see like now bosses, you know, like like trying to switch, you know, like their workforce from like uh uh, undocumented people to documented people. So, like, for example, we had like a, a nice restaurant in downtown New Haven called Articles Bookstore, and they own this uh, bakery called Chavaso. And what he, what like the owner has been doing like uh, for the last uh, for the last uh, few years is like trying to replace as many people who doesn't have any documents, and that's happening right now. Like, so every day we're like getting. Um, this um, this uh, news and like uh, this morning I was like bringing like uh, Paulina with one of our members to to see to check with uh, uh, immigration and she was telling me like uh, she was in a farm and basically like we don't have a lot of guest worker um, experiences here in, in Connecticut but she said that since last um, since uh, um, Trump got elected. Right now, the the owner of the farm is like trying to replace is bringing more guest workers from uh, Africa and from Europe, you know, and from the Caribbean to replace many of the workers and and her farm. And she she was really worried. And I said, well, I think maybe we need to start getting start getting more creative. Maybe we need to start like. Uh, you know, start seeing our skills and how we can like maybe create worker centers where we can like provide direct services to people in the in in the community and <clears throat> try to survive. You know, this administration. So that is that's the conversation that we have right now. You know, how we're going to see the future. You know, and I think uh, 
I think uh, in, in New Haven, we have been involved in this uh, uh, dispension of the sanctuary concept because like a lot of cities in the United States, they see, um, they see like, uh, they, they call themselves a sanctuary, but I think sanctuary has to be accompanied with like a real policies that really help the people. And that's something that we have been doing it here in the city. And we had like in these conversations with the politicians in, um, in New Haven, um, people who they are going to be deported, you know, I think, you know, like we say you have to fight back, you know, like don't, don't give up, you know. So right now we have like a family who are like in sanctuary, like a three, three or four blocks from this building, you know. So I think that's, that's the future, you know, like resistance and, and every, in every manner, you know, be created and just believe that if we work together, we will survive, you know. So we're gonna open it up to questions and as everyone's getting ready to raise their hand really fast, uh, I wanna first recognize some folks that have been sneaking in around the edges off planes and trains from all over the world. Uh, we have a, a large number of folks from the working group on modern day slavery that are here that are many of whom have supported the groups on the stage and others like them around the world. So if you could just stand or raise your hand if you're on the side so we can recognize that you're here and appreciate the work you've been doing and the work we're gonna do in the next couple of days together. Raise your hand. And also, uh, I feel like there may be some ULA members in the room. I'm hearing some snapping. So let's uh, give them all a hand. <laughs> okay, so questions. And if you could. If you could say your name and if you were with a department or an organization or whatever, we'll take the gentleman and then the woman in front. So we're going to take a few questions and then go back to the panel for all of them. Um, so I think the next question is on this side. And it is important to use the mic so that our uh, translator can catch. <laughs> bueno, primera, buenas noches. Gracias por estar con nosotros. Um, and I, we've already met Mr. Moneybags. Um, from New Orleans. Uh, so for context for everybody else, uh, a few years ago, there was a, um, and I'm a graduate student at the Yale School of Drama, I'm a dramaturg, um, and it's been like five years since we've met. So um, a few years ago, there was a conference in New Orleans called uh, NET, N-E-T, which is the Network of Ensemble Theaters. And these folks uh, from New Orleans uh, were part of a, a, they shared a performance that was devised um, between uh, the black and, and Latinx communities in New Orleans. And it was social action that happened on the streets of uh, informing the community um, of a common struggle. And I believe you played Mr. Moneybags, right? Which was the common, <laughs> common kind of, yeah, I know, oh no, I remember. <laughs> I have a photo somewhere. Uh, uh, but, but uh, and it was a, a really great model. It reminded me a lot of the work 
uh, that Luis Valdez and El Teatro Campesino did in the 60s with United Farm Workers. And I'm wondering, um, first, uh, what can we artists do nowadays to support you? And are there um, movements already afront in your local communities that um, you'd like to shed some light on uh, right now? That's a great question. Uh, can we take one more? Thank you. Uh, so I'm Sasha Turner, fellow in the Gilman Berman Center. I, I have a question about the white supremacy sort of counter protest that takes place here in New Haven. I think I'm sort of reflecting on what happened in Charlottesville a few weeks ago. And you sort of listen to a lot of the narratives, particularly here in the North. And the picture that's often painted, and it comes out a bit in the presentations as well, is that sort of con the, the discussion around the Confederate flag, the Confederate monument, et cetera, and all those vestiges of slavery, uh, it's something in the South and it doesn't happen here in the North. So I wondered uh, if John, I think it John, you were the one who mentioned the white supremacy counter protests here in New Haven. I just wanted to hear a bit more about how that manifests here uh, in New Haven. Um, and I also wanted to hear about the partnership that's been created uh, between the police department and uh, the labor department as well. Uh, how has that worked? And beyond New Haven, are you aware of that kind of coalition taking place anywhere else? Thank you. So why don't we um, why don't we uh, uh, let the panelists respond to each question or to one of the questions? There's a lot to. I don't know, but you know, I, I didn't hear well that first question. You know, I don't know if you had the same impression. Or, well, so can you repeat the, the question for me? The first question is about the role of the Catholic Church and the leadership of the current pope in having an impact on organizing. Is that mm -hmm. a fair way of translating? Yeah. Th that's part of it, but but yeah. it, the fact the fa the fact of all of these popular social movements. Uh, being able to have global meetings now, right. first at the Vatican, then in Bolivia, and and the Pope and Peter Turks and his uh, one of his colleagues being very supportive of them. If any of you have an in with the Pope, yeah. <laughs> we, we would love that. Um, we, we've been trying, actually, we've been trying to uh, communicate, uh, but we know it's, it's really, really hard. And, um, you know, other, other issues take priority, uh, and sometimes uh, people that are probably around the Pope are, <clears throat> uh, have reservations or uh, will have a little bit more closeness to certain uh, movements, which is good. But, um, yeah, we have been trying to be able to talk to him um, about this. At the local level, our organization started um, from a borough room of the Catholic Church. Um, and um, it has changed, but we have had the support of the national, um, uh, the bishops, uh, what's the official name? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so, so yeah, we, we haven't had um, a direct endorsement because I don't think they internally they can do something like that, but we have had their support. But uh, if we are able to connect with uh, someone like the Pope, um, that would be very powerful. Um, so let us know. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, about the second question about theater, what can artists do? I feel that in our campaigns, we have uh, had a, an army of uh, artists coming to Imokali prior to uh, the national actions that we do around March. And um, they have been given life to, to the messages that we need to bring to people um, in a festive uh, way to talk about the oppressive things that we need to eliminate. Um, it's something that has worked a lot in, in getting people excited and involved uh, music has been um, always with us. Um, Sones, traditional music from Veracruz, have always been part of our actions. And uh, in fact, there's a whole network of uh, musicians that have uh, started with us when we were uh, fighting to bring Taco Bell on board. Um, and they came, they had a, a center, 
And from that center, the older members uh, spread to different places and they started different uh, new groups that have uh, connected with us and with other people. So we see art um, as a really powerful uh, form of resistance and it has worked be beautifully on, on changing and bringing, bringing people on board. Because, um, you know, even though this is really hard, um, the realities that we are aiming to change are, are painful, but if we're not able to dance or to, to laugh or to sing, then we're gonna get lost or born. Uh, we need to be able to also joke around. So, mm -hmm. come to me, Mokali, I would say. <laughs> <laughs> no, she has to do the work for Sydney <laughs> here. <laughs> Before you go there, okay. <laughs> we'll have a duel here. <laughs> uh, yeah, um, this thing about the Catholic Church, I, I have my. I'm, I grew up Catholic, so. <laughs> but then, you know, I like with this sanctuary movement that we have in, in New Haven and that we're spending all around the state, you know, the Catholic Church, the Catholic Church has been very silent. And my experience, you know, around United States is very conservative, uh, which is pretty bad because, like, I just came back from Colombia and I had to see the message of the Pope Francis, and it was very lifting, you know, like talking about human rights and and peace and and so when we start like these uh, conversations about the the the. Um, the sanctuary, um, I think everybody sign up, you know, like the, the Jews and the Muslims and the Pentecostals and the Methodists, but not a, not a single church, you know, has been, the, from the Catholic Church has been saying yes, you know, actually one, one church from New Haven, they say, no, we don't want to become a sanctuary. So I think that's, that's not very helpful. So. I think I have been encouraging people who, because I, our majority of the people is Catholic, you know, I keep telling them that maybe they should start like pushing, you know, their congregations or their churches to start be, to speak more um, on these issues that they are very um, on, on the table right now. So, um, on the this question of the white supremacists, you know, yes, they came and. The, the interesting thing is that they are not from New Haven. They came from outside of New Haven. Um, so we we were very effective, you know, in like kicking them out from New Haven. Um, so uh, in that time, you know, in 2007, you know, like uh, um, we we really try, we we start talking out amongst the the New Haveners, you know, and I say. We need to start these people, and so we were able, like through those conversations with the Afro American community, we were able to block their hate message, you know. And with this new administration, now we had now all these alt right groups, you know, t you know, they try to come into New Haven and organize an, an event, and, and they came like 20 of them, and we brought like 300 of us. And even like the police, they didn't agree with us, but they got kicked out from the from the city. And but that's that's a reality. I think that's that's something that's happening. We know they are organizing in other parts of the state, and that's something that we need to figure out how we can, you know, you know, take the experience of New Haven and start like, um, you know, try to block their actions. Um, the this uh, idea of the police working with the labor department was working fine for the for time or for one, you know for like a a few few years but right now we the, we right now we had like a changes in the police department um <clears throat> we feel strongly like that you know like there is like two different forces in the the labor and uh, the police department you know and like there is like one that is very racist and I think they have been imposing themselves, you know, for the last few years. And right now we're looking for like to have a conversations with the new chief, which is uh, Chief Campbell, and try to bring back the idea 
to the table because it was very successful when like somebody's stealing wages but they receive a letter directly from the police department say hey you have to figure out how you can like uh um you know pay back the work the worker before we take an action i think that was very effective but again you know because all the changes and all, all the like realities mm -hmm. and and the internal police uh, politics inside of the police department so I think we need to bring back that conversation. And we have been looking to meet with the chief. Uh, he canceled the meeting like a month ago. Now we're looking to see how we can reschedule that meeting because I think that was an important idea. Uh, and Kat, we're waiting for you. Because I know, no, no, I think, you know, like the, the, the art, the arts and the performance is, you know, like to bring the message to the community. I feel that is the best way to like, like, you know, asking somebody to read a book or to read a pamphlet, you know, uh, is is a ch sometimes it's a challenge, you know, for a community that sometimes they don't like when they came from the rural areas of Latin America, they don't they don't read or write. So I think, you know, I believe in the you know street theater, you know, to bring messages to the community and to educate, you know, like and to advance the movement. Yes, you know, uh, thank you. You know, but the, you know the the oppressed, the theater of the press is one of the, 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 the one of the. You have to read that. You don't read, you didn't read that. You know, it's very very important because theater communicates very easy. You don't need to to speak the language. You know, it's a very great tool. You know, with music and, and theater, we, are, we we is used by by maybe all the organizations that I know. And actually, we are creating the Cumbia group of the uh, Henderson now, and with the, with the people. You know, the people wanted to to have that, and that's very important because it's a it's a, a powerful uh, way to send message to people that you know heard the music, and that that's very important. And uh, the first question, you know, because I I skip that. Uh, you know, uh, I'm Catholic too. You know, but the, unfortunately, the, the Catholic Church in in the South is is, is very white. Uh, they, they don't like too much us. Uh, you know, I went to rural places, personal uh, experience, went to rural places and tried to, to connect with the, the people that were coming to the, to the, to the, <laughs> to the church with my, my co-worker that was you. And, 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 and they asked me, you are Catholic? Yes, I am. I said, you are you? I am you. I know you don't, you don't go with me. Go with me, you too. And, and, and they got, you know, try to, you know, create division in between that. And I, I really, I don't care about that. In, in the other, uh, in, on the other hand, we are working with, in a pool of, of, of churches, you know, that in, in the interfaith churches and the Jeremiah group work, you know, and we are working together to, to, to get things, you know, and they are supporting us, supporting the organizing in, 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 in a very good way. For example, they go with us to, the, to with, with the members of the Congreso to the ICE offices to you know to help uh, to help them to make a protest inside ICE offices because there are local people local people being priests from their churches and they go and they they cannot you know they well they, they could arrest them but they cannot arrest a priest very often no? and that's that's a way that we are using that. Uh, you know, in the, in the white supremacist, uh, yes, in New Orleans, we are very proud that we tear down the status of these this, uh, people that they are not. When you are in, in, in Mexico, for example, or in, in Latin America, you have a hero in, in, in a statue. You don't have, a, you know, people that don't deserve that. You know, and, and that actually, you know, that's what, a very, very good, uh, you know, we were part of it. We, uh, we and the, the, the Neola Workers Center were part of it. You know, the white supremacists are very, very fierce, defending the, the, the you know, the, the status of, uh, you know, the General Lee, you know, there, you know, we were, but you know, we, we were success, you know. The, now the, the, the word is spreading into a different, uh, you know, cities and they try to do the same. We are, we are very proud too, to, in, the, in the thing of the police in, in DOL and immigration, because they are working in, in, in many places, the police and immigration work together. That means that they stop you, but they don't have, the, they, don't, they, they don't have why, they don't have to ask for your status. A police stop you, you don't have to ask for your status. They ask you because you have a racial profile. 
you know. And, and we are very proud in New Orleans with a, a lot of work for many years. We, we you know, the, uh, the mayor of New Orleans, you know, said that they, they don't work. New Orleans don't work, the Orleans, Paris, don't, don't work with, with immigration. That, that means that if they, that they stop you, the police of New Orleans stop you, they don't ask for your papers. And this is, a, 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 you know, we want to reply this in many other places because it's very important. Because you, you, are, a, a, you are working in a place, you are doing things for the place to do better in, in, for your family. And, and it's not good to, you know, to force the people to ask or ask or stop them because they saw you different in, in racial profile, you know. And that, that's uh, rapidly the thing I answered. I don't know if also you want to add anything more. Uh, hi, I'm Noelle D'Amico. I'm a senior fellow at the National Economic and Social Rights Initiative. And I have a question both for National Guest Worker Alliance and also for the CIW. I'll start with CIW. I know that the companies that have entered into the Fair Food Program have made legally binding agreements. And that has taken um, those fields from being what one US prosecutor called ground zero for modern slavery to a point of slavery prevention, where cases are actually being prevented at this point. What is it that companies have agreed to that is making that change real? And National Guest Workers Alliance, you're looking at the supply chain as well. And can you tell us a little bit more about what you're seeking from those companies uh, that would be effective in ending conditions of modern slavery? Um, <clears throat> the companies that have signed these agreements, um, you're right, they are um, legal binding agreements, which means that we can take them to court uh, in New York if they are not compliant with what, uh, what's established in the agreement. And basically, uh, under that agreement, they have to cut purchases if there is a case of slavery happening in any of the farms that are supplying them. They commit to buy from uh, participating farms that are implementing all the rights that are part of this booklet. Um, and um, any farm that's supplying them will be cut if they refuse to uh, fix a problem that was reported by a worker. Uh, in other words, any complaint can become a zero tolerance. If it's a complaint that's ignored by the tomato grower, um, where they are producing those tomatoes or the peppers, uh, same, same deal with peppers and strawberries. And um, what makes this powerful is the fact that it is not, uh, slavery is not an issue that's going to disappear um, with the laws that exist. Because uh, it's not a matter of, of the laws that exist. It's a matter of who's, who enforces them at the end of the day. So um, a prosecutor once said, we're not going to prosecute our way out of this one. And when you think about why the program works in preventing slavery, then you're going to notice that the reason why is because um, in the past, before the program existed and was implemented in these farms, uh, the consequences of uh, having people on slavery conditions uh, were only uh, fo uh, falling on top of the crew leaders that were directly involved in forcing people, threatening them, um, uh, punching them, like those who were committing the abuses directly, the coercion and, and the keeping of their uh, visas and the, the threat, threat of killing them and their families, they were prosecuted. And the growers will always just wash their hands and say, uh, this uh, is something that we didn't know, it was a bad apple. But with the program, the growers are responsible for the first time. Um, and as a condition of uh, being part of the program, the growers have to now employ each worker directly. So before the, the companies would say it's not our problem, and they had a system in which there was a firewall. On the other side of that firewall, there was a crew leader, a world of crew leaders recruiting people. And 
paying them and sometimes not, or forcing them into extreme uh, conditions of abuse, um, the conditions of slavery. Now the companies have to be uh, responsible for whatever it is happens to their workers. And this is only possible due to the, the nature of those agreements. Mm -hmm. And because of that, if a grower is caught of the program, that means that while they are in direct competition with other huge growers that are producing up and down the East Coast and some of them in California and other states, um, they are gonna miss the opportunity to sell to the 14 corporations. So who, whoever of that, uh, those uh, 14 corporations are buying from them, they're gonna lose them immediately. So imagine if we had all the buyers, all the corporations signing on to this, and there is a case of slavery. No grower will be able to escape the responsibility. So that is why it is important to bring more uh, buyers to do the same. Because as it is, um, if a grower escapes, they can still try to find business with corporations like Kroger, like Wendy's, and others that have not signed and continue to do business as usual. So the way to prevent slavery is to tighten, uh, to tighten the, the labor conditions with the market. And by doing that, you create uh, an incentive that's worth millions and millions of dollars of losses, which has never been implemented by any law um, that have existed to prevent this. So that's what makes it effective. In very similar to, the, to that, you know, we, we are working in the, the supply chain, you know, I'm, I'm gonna be fast this because, you know, the time is out. Uh, you know, we are looking, to, the, the, you know, to make responsible that uh, somebody of the supply chain, you know, the, 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 actually the, the buyer, the buyer has to help us to, to prevent the, you know, the exploitation of workers in the supply chain. You know, and that's very similar, I said, to, to the, the tolerance zero slavery. You know, and uh, we we used to we went to the uh, ILO last year for first time with the with the message of the seafood workers. You know, and, and we met with workers from from different parts of the world that do, they are doing the same. Fishermen from Thailand, fishermen from you know that they they live as labor, you know, uh, there. You know, fishermen from different parts from India. You know, and they and they and they are part of the supply chain. You know. And they don't. They, they have the same problem that we had, we, because they they buy for, they send the, the, the product for the same uh, buyer, but they don't know who is, is the responsible of them. The, the the boat, you know, the buyer, the, the distribution distribution center. Who, you know, and this is what one of the the part of the why we create the accord, the forced labor prevention accord, because the, the prevention accord. El acuerdo, we, we name in Spanish. You know, we we know we know who is the, the responsibility of these guys. In, in the U.S., for example, if, if, uh, Whole Foods buy a lot of, of from this plant. You know, he has to be responsible for what happened with the workers in the in the, in the fields or in the plants. You know, that's that's the, the the way that we're thinking. And we are we have to be very honest. We we, we brought this from uh, the you know the there is a the floor wage uh, campaign in India. You know, they, they were working with, with other countries together to have a, a floor wage, to, uh, you know, uh, uh, the salary uh, for all the countries in the, in the same, in the, in the similar, not, not too much or too less. You know, and that's a, a campaign that we, we think is, is, is important to, to share because it makes you open your eyes and your mind. Um, and, you know, we, and the other thing is that we're working with, with other countries, you know, like uh, sender countries and, and people that they're bringing people from, from us and bring, and we're trying to reach the, the countries that they send the product here too, you know, to, to, to have a, like a pool of, of heads to, to think about this, this problem. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I think we are unfortunately out of time, but uh, we're going to quickly wrap up. And I will make a, uh, just a, one quick comment. First of all, just thank you to the panel so much for uh, sharing your yeah, extraordinary insights. Um, I just have one, I guess, one quick comment, which is as an historian and as an activist and former labor organizer, I'm struck by how uh, the comfort that I take from uh, thinking about how in the past the labor movement at its very best 
that didn't wait to become legal to get moving. And I so appreciate the way in which you are uh, working with the law, but not relying on the law. Um, and what makes the transformations you're describing so powerful and hopeful is that you are organizing first and using the law to achieve as an organizing tool and not simply as a kind of top-down hope. If we can only get a new deal again, bullshit. You're, you're, you're creating that power uh, among your members, but also for a much broader set of actors. And that's inspiring, and it, it draws on the very best parts of the civil rights story, the abolitionist struggle, uh, as well as the labor movement. The second thing I was going to say is I'm just, I was blown away, honestly, candidly, by how you are using humanity as an organizer, as organizers. That your sense, you, you understand, and maybe I'm putting words in your mouth, but uh, it's not just a strategy. It is coming out of a deep conviction. You know your strength where your power is. And it is in that sense of humanity that is something that uh, people who are not directly affected by the supply chain also need and uh, are indebted to. I, I think of scripture, the rejected stone becomes the cornerstone. I'm sorry. Um, it is a kind of, there's a moral vision, a moral universality in what you're saying that uh, social movements at their best have understood and embraced, and it, it gives power, um, and it's inspiring. So I want to thank you for that. Um, and then uh, I'll turn it over to my excellent uh, uh, comrade, JJ. And I just wanted to say also, uh, real quickly, um, the kind of moral imperative uh, is something we all share, whether we live in the north or the south. Uh, if you live in the north and grew up in it, you know that racism ain't a southern disease, if only that were the truth. Um, and there are so many ways to organize, whether you're a student, uh, as a former mem member of GSO and as an organizer for justice here at Yale. Um, it's been a long struggle. Uh, it's a good struggle. Keep it up. So what I really love about organizers is that they make you feel hopeful and they're giving you this roadmap <laughs> underneath it all. And I think, um, you know, although the, the use of the language of labor trafficking, forced labor, modern day slavery um, has sort of been woven in and out of the discussion, these are the campaigns that are at the cutting edge of that work in the last 10 years. These are the some of the only campaigns that have led to successful prosecutions and visa trafficking victims, visa vic for, vic for survivors. And uh, so even in the traditional rights remedies language, these are the successful campaigns. But what, we, what, what, what I heard coming through is actually three strategies um, which are quite different than that. Uh, the first is binding agreements up the supply chain, you know, which the Fair Foods Council has shown can be done and can be replicated. Uh, and you know, and and is a, a really important model, and that that it's not corporate social responsibility and voluntary measures. It's actually binding agreements between worker organizations. May look like trade unions in Bangladesh. May look like a human rights-based movement coming out of the field remotely, but that uh, that binding nature and accountability is there. Secondly, that these law, these national laws of immigration have to change because they're unbalancing the power that workers are trying to work in. So it's not just the labor law problems anymore, but it really is these immigration laws. And, and both the laws that constrain guest workers and tie them to one employer and the lack of laws uh, that allow lo um, low wage workers to migrate at all that create undocumented people that create criminalization of those folks. We have to address that. Um, and third, that worker organizations, fundamentally, um, in all kinds of new forms, uh, organizations led by organizers like on this panel, um, fundamentally um, enabled by freedom of association, are the bedrock by which these things rise. So um, we're going to have a reception. We apologize for folks that had more questions and want to get into the nitty gritty, but hopefully you'll have time there. Huge thanks uh, to the Gilda Lehrman Center for uh, making all of this possible and co-sponsors at, <laughs> 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 at the Shell, the Shell Center. <laughs>
uh, as well as the, um, <laughs> the RITM, the Center for Race, Indigeneity, and Transnational Migration. And I'm going to end with a, a huge shout out to Luis, who has interpreted the entire English to Spanish here. <laughs> And also uh, a shout out to the disguised professor, Alicia Camacho, who is a scholar in her own right on these issues and is also helping us out. <laughs> so we welcome you all to uh, more conversation and, uh, and recruitment into future campaigns. I just have a quick, really quick announcement. Um, and I forgot to mention too, I'm sorry. Um, there is this booklet that explains the cases, seven of the nine cases that have been prosecuted that I was mentioning. Um, I only have one copy of this, um, and then I have a copy So we can fight over it. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, of the Wake Forest Law Review. Uh, for those of you who would like to look at what we mean with the worker-driven social responsibility from the legal angle. Uh, if you come to me or to my uh, friend Noel, she's going to be uh, writing you email with the purpose of sending you uh, that information, uh, make, make one available to you. So that's it. Okay, beer, wine, and some good food, one floor up. Thank you all. Thank you.